Eight celebrations take place in Durban tomorrow. This is uh, the event where the party will be celebrating 107 years of existence. And uh, standing by to give us an update on this on the party's state of readiness is my colleague Sakina Kamwendo, who is now standing by uh, with uh, SAPC political editor and uh, political analyst Lukonam Guni. Very good morning to you again, Sakina. And uh, we've seen. Uh, uh, We've seen uh, politicians from the ANC camp on uh, I mean, flirting with voters and potential voters and, uh, you know, just uh, em embracing the January 8th statement which will be delivered tomorrow. You're now standing by with the SAPC editor. It's over to you. Well, thank you so much, Simpi. We're absolutely correct. And of course, um, the ANC has descended upon uh, KZN. And as I indicated earlier, it's not just Echeguini. They are flung out far and wide across the length and breadth of this province. So in case you're wondering where we are, we are on the M4 south side. And of course, uh, behind me, uh, you may have noticed earlier, if you hadn't seen it in reports previously, um, it's what we have decided uh, with Lukona Nguni and Tumisane Tope to call a garden of ANC presidents and stalwarts. The stalwarts, of course, the women, Albertina Sisulu and Winnie Madigizela Mandela, who are somewhere there behind in the far recesses of this garden uh, next to the hashtag 107, because this is, of course, uh, the 107th uh, anniversary of the African National Congress. And um, I was looking at a message here earlier on uh, from one of you actually talking about uh, the statues here and asking who is the guy next to Utata and that is supposed to be Tabo Mbeki so if you can just uh, zoom in there it's Tata then it's, uh, it's supposed to be Tabo Mbeki, Jacob Zuma and uh, Cyril Ramaphosa and there uh, on the other side is uh, Chief Albert Lutuli uh, next to us here is ANC President uh, John uh, Langalibalele Dube and behind him is AB Kuma amongst others and then uh, somewhere in the wilderness there is O.R. Chambo and I'm making light of it because this is what people have been doing uh, talking about this art exhibition and perhaps Lukona Nguni let me start with you your take on this well it's an interesting exhibition though I'm not a curator myself definitely dabbling where I shouldn't be uh, but the positioning of certain people their body language the posture and of course just how they have entirely missed uh, Tabo Mbegi is quite interesting and I I think some of the faces uh, are quite interesting. The posture of uh, Chief Albert Lutuli is also interesting for someone, you know, that would have been a chief uh, in their time in Crowdville, not too far from where we are, and they are postured as if they're, someone said, as if they're going to walk into a generation set. Uh, so I think uh, what is worrying about the women, they are in afterthought. Uh, it would have probably been better if they had just left it as a garden of presidents and not sort of uh, say, oh, by the way, we need to pepper it a bit with a few women and then uh, position Albertina Sisulu and uh, Mama Winnie Matikizala Mandela right there at the back. So the interesting, the politics that went into it, the involvement of the National Executive Committee uh, in this process doesn't seem to be there and it seems fairly absent because, you know, uh, this is the landmark exhibition towards the January 8th statement and the big manifesto launch come Saturday here at Moses Mabida Stadium. And I'm sure, you know, everybody coming through because people have been stopping to take pictures here so it has attracted quite a bit of attention and people will interpret this as they will. But I want to come to the main issues of the day. Now, earlier we spoke to ANC National Spokesperson Dakota Lichwete about the list process, why we are back in KZN when all other provinces have not been exhausted in that rotational system of taking the January 8th statement to all provinces. And we are now going to unpack some of what was said earlier this morning with our analyst and SABC political editor, Tumisani Lope, let's start with you. We back in KZN. Yeah. And you heard what Mr. Lehuete had to say about ANC, uh, KZN, and their importance to the national structure and also being the biggest region. All of that, he says, weighed in. But what's your take on why we are actually back in KZN? Well, well it's interesting. Good morning, Saka. And, uh, and by the way, I think uh, Tambo looks very worried, you know, <laughs> in, that, in that stature. Look, it's a very interesting one, but if you look at how the NEC, uh, led by President Cyril Ramaphosa, since he took over in December, 
they have uh, this huge focus on KZN. So the first time, I think when he started doing his work in January, the first place that they came to was KZN. They went to visit the king, they went through the presidents of the ANC that come from this region. And also keep in mind that KZN was highly divided with a hang-up, so to speak, uh, PEC. And uh, they had to sort that out and ensure some stability of some sort. So, and, and then there's also a JZ factor. You know, former President Zuma remains actively involved in domestic politics of the ANC and of the country. So it, it, it is a very sensitive province. It's a province that the ANC cannot afford to have it divided moving to the election. I think that explains particularly why they are in this pro province, you know, time and time and again. Um, I mean, it's only 2013 that they were here. So if the rotational issue was an issue, then they were supposed to have gone elsewhere. And if my recollection is correct, they were meant to have gone to the Northern Cape as per the announcement that they made uh, in the last January 8th statement. So, it's a contested province within and outside the ANC. So they, they, I think they're trying to strengthen their position. Lukona Nguni, what does this say, though, to the other provinces, a province like the Northern Cape? Because uh, they are the province that misses out and we are back in KZN. So in addition to all the other issues that have been mentioned, the JZ factor, the importance of KZN, because remember, the first conference of the ANC after liberation was also here in KZN in 91. So what does all of that say to other provinces and their standing within the African National Congress? Well, I think uh, the Northern Cape generally suffers a politics of numbers issue. I mean, the least populous province in the country and probably the least uh, that contributes in terms of the national ballot. But it shouldn't make it any insignificant a player within the ANC. I mean, in fact, the Northern Cape, if we were to be quite honest, was probably one of those small, was a very important, cohesive uh, province towards the Nasrec conference, especially on the ticket of President Cyril Ramaphosa. It may be that they understand the necessity to descend on KZN, which in one arm is a gamble. A gamble in the sense that we have seen presidents of the ANC who are not popular coming to KZN and being re received very badly. I mean, you'll remember Tabombegi many years ago at the reburial of Moses Mabida in this province uh, was jeered and all of that and booed and all of these things. Uh, so it is a gamble for President Cyril Ramaphosa in that instance. But on the other hand, it is a strategy that uh, former President Zuma has always tried to employ where you take the battle to the enemy's door and I think you you do that with KZN you understand you are not you are not their popular choice but you need this province if the ANC is to succeed nationwide and I think within the NEC circles and within the people who lead uh, Northern Cape like Zamani Soul they might have been approached made to understand this necessity of course uh, things change and they change very quickly in the in the in the in this political landscape and that is when Tumisani talks about the external factors that confront the ANC in KZN there is sort of an, a reconsolidation of the IFP, particularly with the, inter, with, with the disintegration of the NFP, which was an ANC ally in the 2011 local government elections. So they've moved out now with the 2016. So the ANC is now again on its own, needing to reconsolidate its own ground, while this IFP factor seems to be out there. And of course, you've got other uh, simmering tensions that are... Uh, an offshoot of the ANC differences in the provinces with some newly launched formations that are popping up across the province. So all of that needs... But, you, Sagina, you can't solve things with rallies. Ne? Uh, rallies are meant to be a show of force. You can pack a stadium and uh, your strength is there. So on one hand, psychologically, the IFP might say the beast still lives and still lives. But we know that other provinces can bust in into such events such as January 8th statement. So in terms of resolving the issues that confront them, this is still not the spectacle to entirely use as an antidote as to how members of society feel. And this is now less about internal dynamics within the ANC. It now needs to talk to the electorate. Members of the ANC themselves don't make up 10% of the voters of the ANC. So the people that the ANC should be concerned about are the more than 90% people who are voters but are not members of the ANC. And that's what they need to be doing. And I don't necessarily think rallies are the best way to engage people. Uh, you need to go to 
people on town hall meetings, focus groups and all of that, not because you want them to inform your manifesto, but because you want to be in continuous conversation with them, understand them and let them understand you and the direction to which you are moving. Mm. And uh, just in the interest of time, I want to touch on the issues of discipline uh, that I also uh, try to ask Dakota Lehuete about. In terms of the list process, the ANC uh, National sat and looked at the national list and uh, they, as they've indicated, it isn't a final list. It still has to be vetted. But already there are some interesting dynamics, some interesting names that jump out. So what's your take on what Mr. Lehuete had to well, say? Well, it was interesting that they spoke about the integrity committee uh, that is going to do, let's call it vetting, you know, in a way, and make a determination or recommendation about who should be in. And I, I think for me that's an interesting issue. But as we were discussing earlier that um, with Lucona, that perhaps there's a very thin line between what the integrity committee is doing and what the disciplinary committee of the ANC should be doing. So it, it, it will seem like the integrity committee, when it comes to this vetting, uh, of the list process, it, it, it's, it's, it's doing a work of a disciplinary committee, so to speak, in a way. But I think for me, the bigger issue is that across political parties, the process of drafting the list of who becomes elected members eventually has a bearing in terms of the electoral system, because it's a question of accountability. And I think there's a clear link between how the list is developed internally and the eventual approach to accountability to voters or not as soon as those people become you know, elected officials. And there are debates, by the way, across political parties to say, is this the proper you know, electoral system which gives value? Uh, to the voters, and a, a significant part of that is how this list are, are, are generated, actually across political parties. Mm. 800 names is what they finally settled on, more or less, and as Dakota Lehuete indicated, it will now be going through that vetting process, and people, those whose names have been put forward, they will have the opportunity to either accept or decline. So, what's your take on that list process? I think my biggest discomfort with the list process is the facade of an internal democratic process where you start at the branch level and you say branches must nominate people who should be sent to this uh, legislature and eventually parliament and then you take it through provincial list processes and then you've got a national list conference sort of uh, process and then I don't understand when then the vetting process comes in because the vetting process can then un undermine and undo entirely what branches would have done. Branches were given guidelines by the way. It's not that it's the vetting committee that suddenly has some set of guidelines. In any case the, through the eye of the needle uh, document of the NC has exi existed now for over 15 years and the reality is that it has not been used, has not been implemented and it means if you need to vet what branches have given the national leadership, it means that branches did not not themselves comply with the guidelines that they were given, which means that there is a crisis of a political education, there is a crisis of appreciation of ethics, there is a crisis of appreciation of the ANC brand at the internal structure level of the ANC, at a ground level. And the people on the ground, if they are not within the framework of the guidelines and they are the first port of call to contact with society, it means that the ANC as an entity is actually quite weakened. That is what I am learning through this list process that they still need to go vet. They've got names that they are hoping will not sign nomination forms. Uh, because all you should do, Sakina, now is to tally and say, well, so many branches want so many people. But we do know who is vetting. It's the elites of the ANC who sit in the National Executive Committee. And many of them have a vested interest to see themselves in Parliament, to see themselves in legislature, so that they can continue to enjoy the fruits of incumbency that they do. So they will be an in-group. And there is this out outlier and out-group that is trying to knock inside into that in-group. And I think it, it, it really says the NEC is now being given an opportunity through a vetting process to look after its interests and then include anyone else that it thinks it can co-opt. There, the democratic process that was started at the branch level is entirely decimated.
Well, and, and, and there you have it, at least some of it, because uh, that process is by no means concluded. We know the Western Cape list that was sent back and it uh, was said to not be representative of the demographic of that province. And a similar message to all the other provinces. Every second name, by the way, has to be that of a female as well. And there's also the question of the generational uh, integration, that mix that needs to be brought into those lists. So by no means a done deal but of course we are going to give you back to studio we are out here in Durban in Eteguini and of course uh, on um, later on I think Ayanda Mtlongo yes our reporter she will also be crossing here on Morning Live and uh, she's in a different part of the province and hopefully the president will be where she is at and we'll tell you more about that when we cross to you again for now it's back to Simpiwe in studio all right, Sakina, thank you so much for your update. We appreciate it. That was my colleague, Sakina Kamwendo, in Durban, wherein the ANC is holding its list conference. And tomorrow they'll be celebrating 107 years and also launching uh, the party's manifesto, the election manifesto. It is 8.30. Let's, let's now take a look at the top stories. Make, a, make news headlines.